Let me just give you a brief background to what I'm going to say. I've uh, worked in independent schools in the United Kingdom for 35 years. I was a head for about 17 years. Um, and I know most of the good independent schools in the United Kingdom, so I can talk about them for a bit, if you'd like me to. Um, but in the last three months, I've also done something very interesting for me, which is I've been to visit the 15 schools in England, state schools, that get the best exam results at the age of 16 with disadvantaged pupils. They achieve the greatest progress with disadvantaged pupils to try and um, think about the characteristics of them. So I now know a, a little bit about two very different types of school. Um, when I talk about successful schools, of course, you will all appreciate that there is no one formula. Um, it all depends on the purpose of the school, the type of pupil, and so on. Um, all I can do is give you a few, a few pointers. But one thing I will say, and that is that to me, um, a, a good school is one that makes good progress with its pupils, not just one that gets very good exam results. I have myself taught in, and I know well, uh, highly selective academic schools in the United Kingdom that get brilliant results, and I'm sure they do a fantastic job. But that job is not the same as taking a group of very low ability pupils, maybe at the age of three or four or five, and turning them into something pretty amazing by the age of 11 or the age of 16. Um, and those are, those are very different types of schools. So let me start by making a few simple statements to get everyone underway. Ten things to ensure, if you like, that your pupils do well at school. Ten characteristics of good schools. And there's been quite a lot of research done on this. It's called school effectiveness research. Um, and the answer to the question of what works is no. And most of you head teachers know the answer as well from your own experience or reading. But some head teachers find it harder to implement than others in practice. Um, and the fact that the answer to what makes a good school is known doesn't mean that all successful heads are the same. Far from it. He good heads range from those who are pretty authoritarian to those who believe in a significant degree of uh, delegation of decision-making and responsibility to others. Uh, some schools require huge and rapid change, and they need a different sort of leadership from those that are already in good shape and need only to improve a bit on what they're already doing. Um, a brand new school, for example, I mean, I started a, uh, one of these free schools in the east end of London four years ago. A brand new school needs a head who's very good at marketing. But a school that's already got a fantastic reputation ten years later does not need someone who's good at marketing. It's less important. Anyway, the ten characteristics uh, of the good schools that I know and have visited are these. Top of the list comes good discipline. Because without good discipline, nothing else can be achieved. And good discipline normally comes from the head. If a school has weak discipline, as the lower achieving schools in the United Kingdom do, then the head has to lay down clear rules about behaviour in the classroom, behaviour in the corridors and public areas, behaviour even on the way to and from school. The head has to assume that pupils will misbehave so that the staff need to know the rules and sanctions and apply them fairly 100% of the time. Staff need to patrol common areas during break and lunch time. Um, the head needs to speak in person to the parents of troublesome children and enlist their support. The head has to establish agreed routines for many very straightforward things that schools with good discipline don't have to worry about. But schools which have bad behaviour have to have routines for things like moving between classes and queuing for lunch and how you walk into a classroom, how the lesson starts, what to get out of your bag before the lesson begins, how to end a lesson, how to present work, how to hand work in, and so on. There needs to be clear sanctions um, and there needs to be support for staff who find discipline is a problem. 
So that comes at the top of the list, because without good discipline, nothing else can be achieved. Second on my list um, is having high expectations of every child. And all the best independent and state schools I know have very high expectations for every child. Every child has to be uh, expected to behave well and work hard. Um, there has to be regular questioning in class, marked homework and testing to, sure, to ensure that the teacher knows whether the pupils are keeping up with these high expectations. The school invests in tracking individuals and groups. Um, only three months ago, the Sutton Trust in the United Kingdom published a report, Believing in Better, which showed that one reason why so many girls go to university, many more than boys, uh, in England and indeed throughout the world, is because they're much more likely to believe in the importance of a university degree. Even in year nine, which means 13-year-olds, 65% of girls said it was important to go to university, compared to only 58% of boys. 15 and 16 year olds with similar GCSE results were, were twice as likely to go on to do three A levels if they saw university as a likely goal for them. So it's all to do with self expectation, really. Self expectation. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went to visit King Solomon's Academy in Marylebone, which has the best GCSE results for dis disadvantaged pupils in England. And they work on, even though they're a fully comprehensive school with a complete range of ability, they work on the assumption that all of their pupils will go to university. Every class is named after the year in which that class will enter university. They have high expectations and from that, everything else follows. If a pupil is not keeping up with expectations, there's always got to be a response depending on the circumstances. But you know, that response will include retesting in the case of a pupil who got bad test marks, homework repeated after school if it's late or of poor quality, seeing parents, extra tuition, pastoral assistance to pupils who are held back by emotional or family problems, which are never going to be accepted as an excuse for poor behavior or bad work. And there will also be plenty of rewards and praise for good work or improvement. The curriculum will be stretching, and not just for the most able. So that means studying hard texts in English literature, learning to read music in music lessons, doing life drawing to a good standard in art, making demanding pieces in product design. And there must be systems which ensure that teachers set marked work following a homework timetable. So that's, you know, just a few things to do with high expectations. Thirdly, obviously, um, in this list comes good staff. Good schools invest a lot of time in thinking of ingenious ways of attracting and retaining good staff. And I know that you do here in Dubai. Good teachers tend to have good subject knowledge. They're enthusiastic about their job and their subject. They plan lessons well, they check learning in lessons, they test pupils, and they mark work regularly. They set these high expectations, commanding genuine respect and having an authority to create a scholarly atmosphere in their classes, which allows pupils to be scholars. We know that there is as much variation in results within schools as there is between schools. That's a really important point, isn't it? that parents in Dubai spend a lot of time agonising about which school they're going to send their child to. But in the end, it all comes down to the individual teachers that they get. And the parents will be much better off picking individual teachers than picking schools. Because even in the very good schools, there are some not very good teachers. Um, so there's as much variety in results within your schools as there is between them. So a good head will nearly always have to focus on getting his weakest teachers and his weakest subjects up to the level of the rest. My fourth uh, observation is that the best schools tend to have regular testing. Uh, certainly in the United Kingdom, there's been an awful lot of talk about how bad testing is, how stressed pupils are, how there's too many exams. But actually there are some of us who think that 
the reverse is true, that there isn't enough testing, there aren't enough exams. Pupils have to learn how to commit work to memory. They must have good notes and revision guides. They must be tested on the terms work every three weeks or so, generally across a year group for any one subject. And the results should be sent to parents and put up in a public place. Pupils who do badly should, be the target of improve, should set, be set the target of improving their ranked position and be given help so that they do. So testing is really important. Fifthly, there needs to be an emotional commitment to the school and work. Pupils must believe that their school is a good school. They're proud to be in it. They must like their teachers while acknowledging that their teachers are strong on discipline. They must want to work well and to please the teacher. They must be taught that good exam results are perfectly possible and lead to a better job and a better life. In other words, the pupils have got to see the point of it all. There has to be emotional commitment. Fifthly, cultural capital. Now, many of the state schools I've been visiting, the pupils live in a very small world. They live within a few hundred yards of the school. And even in London, they don't ever go to other parts of London. They only know, really, the few streets around where they live. Children from disadvantaged backgrounds, in other words, don't get to see much of the world. So schools have a responsibility to force such children to visit museums, art galleries, classical music concerts, plays, lectures, and they must, all, they must also be compelled to read good literature because the cultural capital that middle class parents take for granted is a really important part of the education of children these days. Seventhly, there should be parental involvement. There needs to be very good involvement with parents, regular reports on their children, visits to parents who appear to be invisible, newsletters, invitations to events, as well as the routine parents' meetings. Parents should be explicitly told which rules they should insist on in the home and how to help their children do homework. At King Solomon's Academy, as in many schools in the United Kingdom, there, there's a parent school contract. But in so many schools, the parents just sign the contract and send it in. At King Solomon's Academy in Marylebone, the headmaster and the deputy head goes and visits every parent and goes through the parent school contract line by line. And if the parent balks at any sentence in the contract, they then cease the conversation uh, and say, please can we meet in my office in the school to talk about this in a week's time. And they leave them for a week to think about it. In other words, they force the parents to take the parent school contract seriously. Parental involvement is very important. Eighth on my list comes good English. Many pupils don't speak English at home, or they have parents with a very limited vocabulary. But good English is essential for success in most school subjects and many jobs. So all pupils coming up to secondary school without good English at the age of 11 must have extra English lessons. And schools have to make space for that by maybe scrapping other subjects so that they've got room for extra English lessons. It's because pupils fall behind in their English that ultimately they do badly across a whole range of GCSE subjects. And so room has to be made for that. And in addition, all pupils have to be taught to speak well because it doesn't matter how good you are at writing, once you start leaving university and applying for jobs, everything will hinge on your ability to speak well. So I believe, and my evidence shows, that good schools teach pupils to speak well. Ninth, extracurricular activity. Sport, debating, music, drama, all of these sort of things help to develop lifelong interests and friendships which provides something good about the school for those who find academic work rather burdensome. The key thing about extracurricular activities is to, is to find ways of compelling all pupils to be involved in something, something, every term. We know, don't we, 
Um, and I certainly know from research we've done at the Independent Schools Council how important soft skills are. Things like teamwork and resilience and so on. And very often those soft skills, which are far more important than academic results when it comes to making a success of a job, that those soft skills are usually, and certainly in independent schools they are to a huge measure, taught through extracurricular activities, which in an independent school in England might certainly occupy as much as a third of the time available. And finally, tenthly, um, I would say collaboration. That many good secondary schools in England now benefit from being part of multi-academy trusts or loose federations of local schools where they draw on each other's strengths, uh, where strong departments, let's say a strong maths department, helps a weak one in another school. There's a sense of responsibility for the whole community and no school stands alone. Now that's much more difficult in an environment like Dubai where so many of your schools are private and are in a fierce competitive environment. But I certainly think that here in Dubai, as with independent schools in the United Kingdom, that they're missing a trick if they don't collaborate and learn a bit from each other. I'm sure you have all had the experience of going into another school and you leave at the end of the day with three or four things that you've picked up and that's a far better form of professional development than sitting in a lecture theatre. So those are the ten characteristics of good schools. And then, of course, comes the eleventh one, which is to have a head who ensures that one to ten happen. A really good head, supported by, and you call this number twelve if you like, a, a very good governing body who also ensures that one to ten happen. And in private schools only... There's another impo very important uh, characteristic, if you like, of good schools, and that is that they set the fee at the right level, that they've done proper research into the uh, income of their parents, which is easy, no easy enough to do these days if you employ a company to do anonymized research into the uh, fee distribution of your parents to make sure that you're setting the right fee and if you're able to offer bursaries, that you're offering the right number of bursaries and at the right level. That's very important. And then the other thing about, about independent schools, and that's marketing. That all independent schools have to be very good at marketing. Research shows that the most important influence on pupil progress is the quality of the teacher, as opposed to things like school type or the brilliance of the head. And we all know, don't we, that with a weak teacher, a pupil makes about six months progress a year compared to the average, but with a really good teacher, you can make up to 18 months progress in a year. So the difference between the two is 300%. It's rather devastating, therefore, to uh, realise that it's quite difficult to identify good teachers at an interview. A teacher's own educational record doesn't necessarily correlate especially well with their ability to teach. And uh, certainly, some of the very best teachers I've known in my career would have failed an interview with me because they were rather sort of introverted and quiet in an interview setting, but came alive when they taught a lesson. One important finding from research is that while all teachers improve a bit with experience over their per first five years, the best teachers, after five years, are the ones who are already good in their first year. So teachers can be improved, but the best way of ensuring that you've got good staff is to appoint the best ones in the first place. I think that, you know, is a fairly obvious point. Um, let me now move on to uh, some of the published research about teacher quality, just very quickly, and then we'll take... Uh, questions from you. Some of you will certainly have read the research by McKinsey, uh, how the world's best performing school systems come out on top, how the world's most improved school systems keep getting better. And if you haven't read the McKinsey research, then it's worth doing so. Uh, they make the point that there are various things which people tend to assume improve the quality of teaching, but which don't. Um, reducing class size doesn't have much impact. There's not much correlation between class size and academic performance in any system. 
We teachers, of course, we prefer small class sizes for obvious reasons, but uh, it's actually not important. Um, the starting age of education doesn't have much impact either. In Finland, which as you know comes high in the PISA tables, education starts at the age of seven. The degree of central government control doesn't have much impact. Some countries with very good systems have a high level of central government control like Singapore uh, and others like Finland, Finland um, really don't. What really does improve, what does matter most, is teacher quality. And the McKinsey report says, quote, the available evidence suggests that the main driver of variation in student learning at school is the quality of the teachers. And that's an absolutely obvious statement, isn't it, really? But it's obviousness of a kind which is well worth repeating. Um, and there are two ways of ensuring that teachers are of high quality. One is to recruit good teachers to make sure that we, you know, deploy all our resources to ensure that we're trawling the world for the best teachers, that we pay them well, um, and that we look after them when they're with us. But the second way of improving uh, schools is to, is to develop the staff you have recruited so that they remain good teachers and become better over time. And we know that in the United Kingdom particularly, we've been quite bad at that. Uh, and and also, it's fair to say that many teachers, when they've established a way of doing things, are reluctant to change. But those countries who have successfully managed to improve the teaching ability of existing teachers do so using expert teachers who are sent into classrooms to observe and give feedback on what they've seen. Um, the best schools have teachers collaborate with each other and to coach one another and to reflect on be best practice and that certainly works. Um, all research shows that it's very hard for a school to be successful without a good head, and the best performing schools in the world allow head teachers to have time to coach their teachers. That works well. So, um, at that point, at that point, I'm going to stop because there's so much really that one could say about what the characteristics are of good schools, and I'd like if possible, to have the chance now to go into detail in some of those areas, but I'd like to take the cue from you. So, does anyone have any questions, any points they'd like to make, or would you like me to go into a bit of detail on some of the characteristics of these very high-achieving schools that I'm talking to you about in general terms this morning? Good morning. Um, I'm a vice principal of one of the local schools and uh, my background is I'm a, a UK um, qualified teacher and an American qualified um, certified principal with teacher. So coming to Dubai, um, it was a challenge just like you mentioned in terms of qual finding quality teachers. But one thing that has changed in this past few months is Dubai now um, is highly strict in terms of getting the cage to your approval for teachers. And suddenly, um, where you used to have, you know, people with backgrounds that weren't necessarily related to the core contents that we're gonna teach. Now it's impossible if they don't have that background. And I've seen that that has really um, been very effective in terms of recruiting teachers, because not only can you say, well, he obviously wouldn't be a good fit because he has no subject knowledge background. KHG is making it, making it impossible for the schools to get that teacher as an approved teacher through KHDA. Um, and, and, and that in itself I found effective. So this is just a comment to buttress the effective teaching because I'm all into you and everything you've said has just been spot on. So I just wanted to add that good point about KHDA and the changes. Do they, do they require teachers to be qualified? Well, current, well, in 2017, they're going to be making it, um, it's going to be mandatory, yeah. where if you're not qualified, you're going to have to go through a system where everybody has to be qualified from okay. 2017 at yeah. some point. That's the plan. But currently, for you to even get the, um, the, 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 the KHD approval is becoming more strict 
which is to me beautiful. So thank you for that. Point. Yeah. Well, can, let me just make a comment about whether teachers are born or made. Um, the first thing to say is I have known many teachers who were brilliant and had never been trained. And in fact, when I got my first teaching job in 1977 at Eton, the headmaster there told me that he would never employ anybody who had a teaching qualification, which was a ridiculous thing to say. But uh, it makes the point that um, certainly when I went uh, as a teacher, uh, I knew nothing about how to, how to teach other, other than what I could remember of my own teachers. However, I do think that you know, one of the most important characteristics of good teachers is that they do have very good subject knowledge. It's quite hard to see how a teacher can be stretching of the most able, for example, unless they've got really good subject knowledge themselves. So I would much rather appoint, let's say, someone who had read physics at Cambridge University and had never taught a lesson in their life than someone who was coming to teach physics but had never studied physics at university level, which is, of course, a description of most of the teachers teaching A-level physics in the United Kingdom. But having said that, um, I, I do think that um, you know, there is a strong case for teaching teachers. I mean, I think these days we all have a much better understanding of pedagogy. We know that there are good and bad ways of teaching subjects. And also, I think that uh, we know that it's going to be very difficult, um, given the shortage of good teachers, both in England and throughout the world, to find teachers who are of a uniformly outstanding level. And so we have got to accept the fact that in some subjects, subjects like physics and chemistry, uh, product design, these are all areas with the biggest shortage at the moment in Britain, mathematics, that we're going to have to, we're going to, have to appoint some pretty average teachers and then try to turn them into good teachers. And so one characteristic of most of the best schools is that they, is that they do have a teacher training element within them. Um, and several of the schools I visited, state and independent, now have rooms set aside for teaching teachers with uh, one-way glass windows so that teachers can be observed and then commented on. And all of that, I think, is a very good thing. Right, next question or point. I, I have a question and, yeah. and I'd like you, because you are going to be selecting what you're going to expand upon, um, yeah. since, since critical, the critical improvement factor that you highlighted is teacher quality and you again highlighted that um, it's hard to identify who these people are, even in an interview, yeah. um, and we have different parameters. I appreciate what you're saying about, well, maybe we'll just accept some average people. I'd like to think that perhaps also there's other ways of doing this, and perhaps we need to start thinking about industry partnerships. Um, because if you're, I'll, t I'll take my example. You know, I'm a biochemist by trade, and I worked in a lab, cancer research facilities, and I taught science, chemistry, and physics AP, yeah. and then I've left. I haven't taught since, and I've, I've been doing other things in education. You know, is there a way to have these people, these lab people, these scientists, or whatever it is where the needs are, come back and work with teachers who have the pedagogical content knowledge, not just the content knowledge that they would be bringing, so that we can expand? Because if we continue down this track, where we just say, well, we don't know, how we're going to fill it out. Let's get some average people and, and hope that we can train them up. When well, we know this isn't working, I'm just wondering if there's any examples in those schools that you saw or in the UK where they've thought outside this box. Absolutely. So um, there have been two really good initiatives, or well, three, let's say, in the, in the UK recently. The first, the first has been Teach First, which you'll all know about, where um, Good graduates from good universities are encouraged to go into teaching in difficult schools for a minimum of two years. And Teach First has been a tremendous success uh, and is one of the reasons why London has gone from being having the worst educational standards in the UK to having the highest. Um, 
and te Teach First is now the single biggest recruiter of graduates, including at Oxford University uh, in England. Uh, and so that's helped a lot. And of course, many of those Teach First uh, graduates stay on way beyond their two years, and indeed a good number have become head teachers in the last three or four years. Secondly, we, there is a, a big effort being made to encourage um, people who are halfway through a career of the sort that you're describing to come into teaching. And, uh, um, and, and this is working to some extent. Because I think people are beginning to realise that there's more to life than money. And, you know, we only live once. And being a banker or an accountant or even an army officer is not as fulfilling a job as being a teacher, where every day of your lives you're making a big difference to individual children. And after 10 or 15 years, in a highly paid but rather boring job that doesn't actually take human society forward very far, many people are moving into teaching. And then the third innovation in England has been to focus teacher training within schools rather than within universities. And that's also quite attractive to people because it means that they go from day one to, into a school doing the job, being paid, many of them, and that has also tended to work. But it's still the case that there are big shortages in certain subjects. And, um, and in the case of subjects like important subjects like physics and chemistry, it's holding the whole country back. Hi. I heard you saying uh, there is uh, little or not much correlation between the size of the class and uh, the quality yeah. of teaching learning. Could you please uh, shed more light on that? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so it. So there have been many, many research, uh, many, many pieces of research done on this crucial issue of what is the optimum class size. Obviously, most governments have taken a great interest in this because it, you know, it hugely affects the amount of money that's being spent on education and uh, and effectiveness of education. And um, the, the famous example is California, where. In the 1980s, they decided to greatly reduce the average size of classes, and the results went right down, because in order to reduce the size of classes, they had to recruit many more teachers, and because there is a finite supply of teachers, the teachers that they were recruiting were not very good. They had to buy in a lot of not very good teachers to reduce the class size. So, um, there is no research anywhere, really, which shows that class size correlates well with outcomes. In other words, a class size of 15, which is quite common in independent schools in the United Kingdom, is actually no more effective than a class size of 25. Now, of course, there are you know, a number of reasons why you might want to have small class sizes. Uh, one is that it's less work for the teacher, which is, you know, is a good thing. And secondly, parents think that class size matters, and if you're trying to persuade parents to send children to your school, then that could be a marketing uh, device. Uh, thirdly, having small class sizes helps a lot with pastoral care, doesn't it, if you're giving one-to-one -one help with individual children. But if your aim is simply to get good GCSE or A-level results, good IB results, whatever, <coughs> class size is not that important. In all my life, I have had um, heads of departments say to me, oh, headmaster, you know, I couldn't possibly teach an A-level set size of more than 15. But if you go to the highest achieving state schools in the United Kingdom now, you'll find them with set sizes of 25 at A-level, getting very good results. Um, but anyway, if you want to follow this up, you just need to uh, Google it and look at the research, which is very clear. But it's not something that most teachers uh, so that most parents uh, believe. Yeah. Last question. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Bernard.
perhaps uh, I'd like to take this opportunity as a Brit who's been in Dubai for 20 years to ask you for your views, or solicit your views on the current obsession of the Prime Minister in the UK with grammar schools. Oh, yes. Well, um, yeah, grammar, so grammar schools. There are two or three things to say. First of all, um, all the research, and if anyone wants the, the detail, I can give it to them, shows that pupils who go to grammar schools do better than they would have done had they gone to a comprehensive school. But all the other pupils in the area who go to the secondary moderns, let's call them, the non-grammar schools, do worse than they would have done had the grammar schools not existed in the area. As only a quarter of pupils in an area would ever go to a grammar school, and three quarters would not, that means that the net effect of having a grammar school is damaging to exam results in an area like Kent, for example, in southeast England. The research is very clear on that. Um, however, there is something to do with uh, the rights of individual parents. If individual parents want their children to go to a grammar school, want there to be a grammar school, and that's something you have to take into account, even though it may not be in the best interests of the community as a whole. So that's one point. And secondly, that this government is trying to appeal to what might be called, I suppose, lower middle income, what we sometimes call C1, C2 groups, because they are the big group of floating voters in England. And the Labour Party at the moment is very weak, and it's the Conservative Party is quite understandably trying to grab this huge group of floating voters who did vote, incidentally, for Margaret Thatcher. They are amongst the people who bought their council houses, for example, when the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher made that possible. Now, um, survey research shows that this C1, C2 group of floating voters do like grammar schools, do want grammar schools. They associate them with high academic standards, school uniforms, good behaviour. The unfortunate thing is that very few of the C1, C2 children will ever get into a grammar school, so they're kidding themselves. They don't know that if a grammar school is set up in their area and they don't go to it, then probably the, the standards in the schools they will be going to will be harmed. Because in the schools that are left, that used to be called secondary moderns, but let's say these days they will be called comprehensive schools, that those schools will be damaged because the top 25% of the more able children will have been stripped out, so all the best role models will have gone, and the good teachers will tend to flock to the grammar schools. So, the net effect is bad. What do I think is going to actually happen in England? I think that, you know, this, this proposal is a green paper. Um, it's, there's a huge amount of opposition to it. Uh, it may have been something that was put out there to deflect attention away from Brexit and all the other problems that the government has got. And my guess is that there will be some grammar schools, but they'll be limited in number and probably confined to those areas in the United Kingdom or in England where standards are particularly low. I don't think it's at all likely that there's going to be a sudden rush of many hundreds of new grammar schools. Thank you.